Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. I invite you to listen for a word from the Lord. Now, I want to say, too, that I usually I would have given this scripture to the liturgist and taken the Genesis scripture, but because it had all the names in it, I tried to be nice and give it to me so that you can make fun of my pronunciation and not somebody else's. Let's listen for a word from God. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Animnadab, and Aminadab the father of Nishan, and Nishan the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asa, and Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham. And Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shelatiel, and Shelatiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer the father of Methan, and Methan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is this old comedy movie from the 90s called The Rat Race. Did anybody, has anybody seen that? A few, a few people. It's a really, a really funny movie about a bunch of complete strangers racing each other in a kind of treasure hunt. There's a character named Nick Schaefer uh, who's a part of the treasure hunt but who's a bit of an unwilling participant. Because Nick has high hopes of one day running for office, for political office, and so he has spent his whole life playing it safe, not taking any kind of risks, and trying to avoid any appearance of scandal or impropriety. And he also works hard to distance himself from other folks who might be participating in questionable behavior. So as you can imagine, uh, in a comedy, he inevitably gets sucked into the crazy antics of the other participants in this treasure hunt, even though he tries desperately to avoid them. Now, Nick Schaefer is a fictional character, but I think that there is a little bit of him in each of us. Not that we all secretly want to run for office, but that many of us put a lot of time and energy into avoiding public disgrace or embarrassment. And that makes sense, right? None of us want to be embarrassed or ridiculed by others, especially in a public arena. But the truth is that no matter how intentional or conscientious we are, we all have things in our own lives or in our family history that we are not particularly proud of. We all have certain things in our history that we would rather keep secret, things that we hope no one will ever find out about. We all have skeletons in our closet or in the family closet. Whether it's something someone else has done or something someone has done to us or something we ourselves have done, we are not alone in this. Jesus was certainly no exception to this. Christian tradition teaches that Jesus himself was without sin, that he lived a perfect life, but that doesn't mean that everyone else in his family was perfect. In fact, we know from scripture that they weren't. This first chapter in the Gospel of Matthew that we just read lists out the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew starts right at the beginning with Abraham, and then he lists all the generations through to Jesus. And the gene genealogy, which is traced through the male line, surprisingly in the Gospel of Matthew also includes four women. One of those women is Mary, the mother of Jesus. We would expect her to be mentioned, right, since Jesus is not uh, biologically related to Joseph. 
But that the other three women are included is a surprise. These women, Tamar and Rahab and Ruth, all act in ways that would have been considered scandalous by the standards of the day. So not only are they named, but their real names are given. If you heard, um, if you caught when uh, they talked about David uh, being the father of Solomon, they mentioned that David's, um, that Solomon's mother, um, they didn't name her by name. Her name is Bathsheba, but they just kind of skated over that. It was the wife of Uriah. But Tamar and Rahab and Ruth are all named. And they all act in scripture in ways that would have been considered scandalous by the standards of the day or even by our standards today. Yet these women are intentionally included in the genealogy of Jesus that Matthew gives. You'd think that he would have wanted to exclude them to try and kind of present Jesus' pedigree, so to speak, in the best light possible for the readers. But I think Matthew makes a point of including them to tell us that there is something we can learn from them. So I'm just going to talk about one of them today, and that's Tamar, the story uh, that Alexa read for us a few minutes ago. Tamar's story is, at first glance, certainly scandalous. And like I told you last week, has all the right ingredients to make a really good soap opera. This has probably appeared in some kind of soap opera somewhere. It has death and intrigue. It has brothers marrying the same women and prostitution and secret and mistaken identities. All of the themes that make for a good story. So let me me give you a little bit of the details. Tamar is a Canaanite, a person who was considered an outsider to the Israel community. She was not a part of their community. Now, this kind of inner marriage was frowned upon because each person brings their own religion and beliefs to the marriage. And so the Israelites tried to keep themselves pure. They didn't want outsiders to marry in. When one person is not Jewish, they believe that it often resulted in the Jewish person being led astray and being led to worship other gods. But Judah had a Canaanite wife, and so he finds Canaanite wives for his sons as well. Tamar marries Judas' oldest son, Ur, and Ur dies before any heirs can be produced. Now, in these circumstances, the Jewish custom considered it the duty of the deceased brother's husband's brother to marry the widow. Now, the reason, I know that would sound kind of strange to us, right? I don't, that in and of itself is a little bit scandalous. But the reason behind that arrangement was so that the brother could produce an heir for the deceased husband. In that way, the deceased family, husband's family line would be carried on, and the inheritance would be secured within the family. But it also meant survival for the woman. If you did not have children, there was no uh, assurance of your survival. Nobody had to take care of you if you didn't have children to take care of you. Judah's second oldest son, Onan, goes through the motions of fulfilling this requirement, but scripture tells us he intentionally prevents Tamar from conceiving. He uses Tamar. He technically fulfills his duty, but he does not fulfill the intent of the law. Instead, he actively thwarts it. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us the reason for his behavior, but we can guess that it was probably greed. He wanted his older brother's inheritance. He wanted it to be secure through his line instead of through what would have been his brother's son. The oldest son inherited a double portion of the inheritance. So with the oldest son deceased without an heir, this double share of the inheritance would have been passed down to the second oldest brother, which would have been Onan. So he has a vested interest in preventing Tamar from conceiving. If she remains childless, he gets his brother's double inheritance plus the one that he would have been given anyway. Scripture tells us that God is displeased with him for acting in this way, and so Judah's second son, Onan, dies as well. Now Judah has a third son, Shelah, and so now that both Ur and Onan are dead and there is still no heir, it becomes his responsibility to perform that duty. But Judah is worried that um, Tamar is somehow responsible for bringing on the deaths of his first two sons. So he tells Tamar to go back and live in her father's house as a widow until the third son, Shelah, is old enough by his standards to be married. Now, sending Tamar back to her father's house cuts her off from her inheritance rights and the provision and protection of Judah. But telling her to live as a widow keeps her bound to her deceased husband's family. She would be unable to marry anyone else. 
In a society where women don't have many ways of providing for themselves, not having a man to take care of her significantly endangers her future well-being. So in the intervening years, while waiting for Shalah to reach the appropriate age, Judah's wife dies. After his period of mourning is over, this is where the scripture um, came in that Alexa read, he goes to oversee his sheep being sheared. Having not heard from Judah concerning his youngest son, Tamar decides to disguise herself and goes to investigate the situation herself. And she sees that Shalai is now eligible to be married, but that she has not been given to him as a wife. So she's stuck. She cannot remarry unless all of her first husband's brothers have died or have outright rejected her. And that hasn't happened. So she isn't married to one of her first husband's brothers. She has no children to provide for her, but she is also not free to marry anyone else. She is basically being held hostage in this very perilous position. In those days, she would have had no recourse through the courts. She could not file any kind of paperwork. The men who were responsible for her well-being would have been responsible to taking her case to court if she had been wronged in some way. It was their job to stand up for her. But in this case, it is Judah, the man who is responsible for her well-being, that has wronged her. He is shirking his responsibility to care for her as the head of household. So having no other recourse, she decides to take matters into her own hands. Since Judah will not provide an acceptable way to carry on Ur's line, she finds a way to do it herself. She, I think... Uh, I feel that she has this like mindset that desperate times call for desperate measures. There is no other way out of this for her. In order to uphold the requirement to provide an heir for her husband, someone to carry on the family line and the inheritance and to care for her, she breaks the law and risks both her reputation and her life in doing so. Tamar is willing to do what Judah is not. Judah's action, or more accurately his inaction, endangers the well-being of Tamar, whom he is supposed to protect, and also risks the continuance of the community. Tamar, the Canaanite, the outsider, risks everything to fulfill the law and to safeguard the community that she has become a part of. So Tamar puts on a disguise, the the version that Alexa read calls her a harlot, and then essentially she stands out on the street corner waiting for Judah to come by. Now, not a lot has changed between now and then in terms of how men view women standing on street corners. But So without knowing her identity, Judah propositions her and they agree on a price. Judah doesn't have the payment with him, which is going to come in the form of one of his sheep. So at Tamar's insistence, he leaves his seal and its cord and his staff as a pledge to her. Judah sleeps with her, still having no idea of her true identity. And then when he tries to send the agreed-upon payment and get his seal and staff back, he can't find her. Meanwhile, Tamar is back at home with her family, and when she is discovered to be pregnant and word begins to get out, Judah acts as judge and immediately condemns her to death. It is well within his rights to do so. It was assumed that she had been unfaithful to Shalah, who she was basically promised to or betrothed to. But before her sentence can be carried out, she sends this pledge back to Judah, saying, the owner of these is the one who has impregnated me. Once Judah realizes what has happened, where his responsibility lies, he repents and admits that he was in the wrong and that Tamar did, in fact, do the right thing. He goes so far as to say, she is more righteous than I. This pronouncement of Tamar's righteousness is surprising. It was a rare thing for an outsider to be considered more righteous than someone within the covenant community. And she's not even a well-behaved outsider, right? Her actions disregarded the existing cultural standards as well as the laws, and she refused to abide by the instruction of those with authority over her. She was a scandalous person. And yet in the end, she is deemed to be righteous, and she even gets a shout-out in Jesus' genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew. So what is it about Tamar's actions that make her righteous? 
This is one of those situations where we don't want to universalize her behavior, right? I would not advocate to any woman to go out and seduce their father-in-law and to trick them. That's not something I would give advice for. But this is a case where her behavior is considered righteous because it was the means, the means through which relationships were made right and justice is achieved. It's easy for us to look at Tamar's actions 3,000 years later and condemn her for them. And that's precisely what Judah and his friends do in the beginning, right? There are some who still would look at uh, Tamar's actions and view her as scandalous or shameful. But were they really? Or is the real scandal and shameful behavior that she was put in this position in the first place by those who were supposed to be caring for her? The truth is that sometimes decisions are complicated. People face complicated situations and ethical dilemmas all the time. And sometimes the right thing to do is not always clear to us in the beginning. One uh, commentator on this passage says it this way, Relationships are more important than rules. Faithfulness may even go beyond the law. And that's what Judah was saying when he calls Tamar righteous. Tamar and other people, especially the women in Jesus' genealogy, behaved in ways that would be judged scandalous, but they are not left out of Jesus' lineage. In fact, they are intentionally included. Matthew does not have to include them. But he's saying to us that they are a part of the family through whom God worked to bring salvation. It's a reminder for us that God even works through scandalous people. There are all sorts of situations that are complicated with no clear answers or solutions. That's part of why our politics are so strongly divided, because every nation faces complex issues that do not have simple, straightforward answers. If they were all straightforward and obvious, we'd have a much easier time agreeing on a course of action all the time. You might have seen in the news recently, uh, in the last few months, there was a story uh, from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where they passed a law making it illegal to feed the homeless population in their city. It was made an even bigger news story when Arnold Abbott, a 90-year-old World War II veteran and two pastors, were arrested together for deliberately disobeying this law. Some people might consider it scandalous or shameful to be arrested, but these men decided that it was more unjust to disobey this law, uh, so it was more unjust to obey this law than it was to break it. As a result of their seemingly scandalous behavior, a Florida circuit court judge temporarily halted that ordinance requiring that all parties enter into mediation, and during the period of mediation, the city is not allowed to enforce the ordinance, and I hope that they'll come together and provide a better way to move forward so that all can be taken care of. One example of the way that God can use our seemingly scandalous behavior to bring about justice for those around us. So I promised last week when we began this sermon series on families that each week we would add in some kind of practical advice for how to be a better family. Last week I told you that I think it takes time to learn your family and that we have to constantly relearn uh, our role in our family and the way our um, family behaves every time that something changes. So this week I want to encourage you to do better in your communication. Learning to communicate clearly and openly can be so freeing and healing for us as individuals and for us as families. Sometimes we get in patterns where we begin to be passive aggressive in our behavior without even knowing that we're doing it. We tell people we aren't upset about something, but really we are. Or if someone offers to help us and we really want to take it, we, you know, we say, well, it's so far for you to drive. Or you know, we say all of those things, but really we want the help that they're offering. So I wanted to encourage you to be more clear in your communication. If someone hurts you, find a way to tell them gently and lovingly instead of holding on to it and being angry for years. If someone offers offers to help you, just accept it with a yes and a thank you. When we were first married, I used to um, tell Dwight, I'm not a mind reader or a psychic. You have to tell me what you're thinking. Uh, How many of us have said that, to whether it's a wife to a husband or a husband to a spouse? I'm getting lots of head nods. And he has certainly had to say it to me more than once. Because the truth is that, uh, that we all say things that we don't mean or we, we refuse to say things that we really want other people to know. So we have to tell people when we're hurt. We have to say sorry when we've hurt someone. But even more important than that, we all need to learn to listen better. 
We need to learn to listen, not to respond, but to really hear the other person. So here's my major tip. If you are listening to someone and in your brain you are already thinking of what you're going to say next, then you are not really listening. How many of us are guilty of that? We do it all the time. I heard thank you guys for your honesty. Parents take note. I heard a saying once, uh, God gave us one mouth that closes and two ears that don't for a reason. We should pay attention to the way that God designed us. Here's the thing, that you never listen is not just the complaint of a problematic relationship between spouses. I think it has also become an epidemic in our world, and we have to make the conscious choice to change that in ourselves and in our families. This week I was blessed to be able to sit and listen to some really hard stories, stories of women who have been deeply hurt by those they love, stories that would make your heart bleed for them. But friends, as I sat and listened and prayed with these women, I got to watch the burden that they'd been carrying for years in some cases be lifted away. They thought they were the only one carrying this scandal, the only one bearing this pain. But they and you and we are not alone. The awesome thing about our God is that God takes even our biggest messes, our biggest scandal, and makes it into something beautiful. As a good friend of mine likes to say, God can take our messes and turn them into messages if we let him. There have been scandalous people all throughout history, and God was able to use them to bring about redemption for the world, and God can use us, too. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.